My name is Jonathan Mavroidis. I'm with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Before we begin, I just want to announce a few upcoming events. On June 11th at 7 p.m., we're going to have General Stanley McChrystal. He's going to talk about his new book, Team of Teams. It's a book about leadership and the new rules of engagement in this complex world. I forgot to mention an event that we're going to have tomorrow with Ian Bremer. He is the president of the Eurasia Group, and he's also Time Magazine's editor-at-large, and he's going to talk about his new book, Superpower, which is, which is about what America stands for, what are the next choices for the United States as it engages globally. And then on July 2nd, we're going to have Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren, the former ambassador, who's now a member of the Knesset, and he's going to talk about his journey as U.S. Ambassador during, or uh, Israeli Ambassador during the um, Netanyahu uh, Obama era. So very interesting, uh, very interesting upcoming events that we have right now. And these events you can get at a discount. Um, just go on nixonfoundation.org or go to the front desk. Um, starting at just $50 a month or $50 per the year, you can get dis significant discounts on, on, on upcoming events. Now to our speaker. Michael Morell has had a 30-year career in the CIA. He was with President Bush and briefed him shortly after the 9-11 attacks, and he was also with President Obama when, during the bin Laden raid in May of 2011. And he's the author of the new bestseller, The Great War of Our Time, the CIA's fight against, Al the fight, fight against terrorism from Al-Qaeda to ISIS. And he's gonna be interviewed tonight by CBS reporter David Bryan. Ladies and gentlemen, Director Michael Morell and Dave Bryan. That's for you. <laughs> Hey, uh, if with your uh, permission, I'd like to ask, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for being here. And, uh, Please, yes, absolutely, thank you. Uh, and we're going to talk at length about the book, and you'll get a chance to ask questions as well. I, I just wanted to see how many people, the book has just come out recently, but how many people have had a chance to read the book? And, and how, many, how many of you have actually gotten a copy of the book now that you're going to be reading? Okay, that's Excellent. great. Well, you're, you're going to have a great time. It's an easy read, and it's a fascinating book, and there's a lot of important information in there, some of which is very controversial. We're going to start our interview tonight with some very current issues that are taking place right now, and I mean today. There were reports on Fox News and CNN today that the advisory on terrorism for military bases and military personnel was raised to the Bravo level. Uh, because of information about a possible attack within the United States from ISIS. So who better to ask about this than the former deputy director and acting director of the CIA? Um, tell me if this is something that we need to be seriously concerned about. We, we hear these advisories being raised from time to time. What's the significance of this one and how concerned should we be? So I think it's just a, a matter of time before um, there's another ISIS-inspired attack in the United States. We've now had two. Uh, the first one was in New York several months ago, which was a, an attempted attack by a guy with a hatchet on two New York City police officers. Um, and just a couple weeks ago, the attempted attack in Dallas. Both of those were inspired by ISIS. Individuals in the United States who had never gone to Iraq, never gone to Syria, um, but who were hearing the ISIS narrative and the ISIS message and decided to act. So we are going to see that again. I think the, um, what we saw in the last couple days is a result of really a couple things. One is that ISIS has repeatedly said that we are going to um, attack the United States because of what the United States is doing against us in Iraq. Um, and two, they specifically called on people to attack U.S. soldiers and to attack U.S. military installations. So I think that's where the, the, uh, the specific warning came from. But I think we need to take it seriously, absolutely. 
Yeah, another important issue that's very current. In fact, uh, this is about a portion of the federal law that will run out on Sunday at midnight unless the Senate takes action to prevent that before that time, and that is the phone record surveillance program, the NSA program. It's something you wrote about in your book. You were appointed to a committee by President Obama to, to look at this when it became public after Correct. Edward Snowden Correct. revealed a lot of details about this Correct. program. If this runs out on Sunday night, what impact will that have on domestic terror, uh, terrorism prevention? Yeah, so I think this is a very important program. This is the so-called Section 215 Telephone Metadata Program. Um, what metadata means is the, the phone number that made the call, the phone number that received the call, and the duration of the call. That's the information that, that, that NSA has. Um, this is a very important program um, because it fills a gap that existed prior to 9-11. And I believe, I don't know, I can't prove this to you, but I believe that if it were in place prior to 9-11, that we may have seen some of the communications between the 9-11 hijackers, um, and we may have disrupted that plot. So it's a very important program. Um, but I also believe that, so that's the security side of it, right? And that's where I come at this. Um, but I also believe in the importance of privacy and civil liberties. And um, there is, given the, given the amount of data in here and the type of data that's in this database, there is the potential for government abuse. And we know from our history that there's been times where the government has abused its power. So we have to take that very seriously. So what we recommended to the president, um, what our review group recommended to the president was keep the program, but don't have the government hold the data anymore, have the phone companies hold it. The government accepted that recommendation. The president accepted that recommendation. That's what they recommended to Congress. That's what the House passed um, almost two weeks ago now, uh, the USA Freedom Act. Um, and I hope the Senate follows suit and passes uh, the same bill. It's important. OK, let's move on now to uh, the, the next important issue that's current, and that is Benghazi. Because last week, uh, the first batch of emails uh, from former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton were made public. Now, there are 50,000 or so emails involved here. Only a few hundred were released at that time, so there'll be more releases uh, during the coming months through January. Um, first of all, have you looked through the, uh, the emails that were released, and is there anything in there that's worthy, any smoking so gun? So the, the, the pile of emails that everybody is focused on are these emails from um, uh, a friend of the Clintons, Sid Blumenthal, um, who was sending her emails about Libya um, prior to the Benghazi bombings and then about Benghazi after the Benghazi bombings. Um, I've looked through all those. I skimmed them. I didn't read them um, um, closely. Um, I have to tell you, I was underwhelmed by them. I don't think there's any there, there, here. Um, most senior officials in government, including me, get emails from, from friends and former colleagues um, providing you with this thought or that thought or please read this or I think this is important. It happens to all senior officials. Uh, it happened to the secretary. It's not unusual. Sometimes you pass those on to your staff and say, hey, take a look at this. Um, those, those emails from Sid Blumenthal never made their way into the highest levels of discussion. I never saw them until I read them two days ago. Um, they never showed up in the sit room. They never showed up in a deputy's conversation or a principal's conversation. Um, I don't know if my analysts saw them or not. I'll tell you, if my analysts did see them, they would put an absolutely no credibility into the information in there because they would have no idea where the information came from. So I was, I don't think they're a big deal. Was there, were there any of your emails that would be in that 50,000? No, the secretary and I never exchanged emails. She was a little level above me there. All right, one, one, one of the issues about this, um, and, and you, you talked about it in your book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you a, a section out of your book. Uh, those arguing against me believe that by saying there had been a protest, and that's, that's one of the issues, was there a protest before the attack on Benghazi, or was this a planned terrorism attack? Uh, those uh, who believe me uh, believe that by saying there had been a protest, CIA and I, in conspiracy with the White House, were trying to hide the hand of Al-Qaeda Al in the attack and thereby protect President Obama's campaign theme that he was tough on terrorism. Now, the, I think the, the issue in question was the, the first part of the analysis that the CIA did two days after the attack. And they said the assault on the TMF, 
that's the mission facility, which is what the consulate there was called in Benghazi, had been a spontaneous event that evolved from a, from a protest outside the TMF. That was, that, that was uh, the, the issue, I think, that, that people are right. concerned about. Was it just a spontaneous uh, uh, sort of eruption from, right. from a protest, or was this a planned terrorism attack? Right, and um, that's what my analysts thought. So two days after the event, when the analysts sat down uh, to say, tell the president what they thought happened, they thought that this was a protest that evolved into an attack. That was wrong. They did not get that right. Um, but they, they didn't get it right because they were trying to be political. They didn't get it right because that's, they didn't have the right information at their fingertips, right? They didn't have the, the right information was not presented to them. So that's what they thought, but they, you know, they were doing their job, calling it like you see it, being a referee, being an umpire. Um, and of, of all the judgments they made that day, that's the only one that's turned out to be, to be wrong. All the other judgments that they, that they made two days after turned out to be right. But that's significant because the administration, again, was saying, we're tough on terrorism and we're winning the war on terrorism. Well, if this was a planned terrorist attack, that wouldn't have looked so good for the administration, right? right? Now, one of the things they said um, in, in, in those first two days, right, one of, the, one of the things they said that they still believe today is that there was very little pre-planning, right? That this was not an attack that was, had weeks or months of planning. This was an attack that probably had hours of planning. And you can actually see that, and we talk about this in the book, you can actually see that in the disorganization of the attack. The lack of a military style assault, at least the first attack on the State Department facility. Um, you had guys run through the gate, running all over the compound, just looking like they were happy to be in the compound. You had them run by buildings where there were Americans. You had them try to kick down doors in, a, in almost a, a comical, farcical fashion, and they failed to knock the door down, and so they walk away. Right? You have them successfully get inside some buildings where there are Americans hiding, and they don't look for Americans, they steal stuff. And one guy walks out with an Xbox, somebody else walks out with a suit. Um, you have them randomly setting fires, um, some buildings where there are no Americans, some buildings where there are. So this is clearly an event with not a lot of pre-planning, right? The other two attacks that night, there was more, it, they were more like a military assault. They were two attacks on CIA's facility in Benghazi, which was separate from the State Department facility. Um, and I think there was more, those were more of a military assault because they had more time. Um, they had additional hours to plan those attacks. So, so two questions flow from that. First of all, it seems to me that since you had not one but three attacks, it's a little harder to believe that this was just something spontaneous that, that wasn't planned. And then the other thing is, it seems to me that what you're saying is that the, the original attack on, on the mission was just a bunch of people that came over with guns and mm. spontaneously decided, let's jump over the fence and attack the, the mission. So what the analysts, so, so, so very good question. What the analysts believe, and, and I believe what the analysts believe, so I'm with them on this. I'm not just saying it's them, it's, it, it's me too. But what the analysts believe is that the guys in Benghazi saw what happened in Cairo earlier in the day. And what happened in Cairo earlier in the day was a bunch of guys went to our embassy, got over the fence and set fire to vehicles and did a lot of damage. So what my analysts believe is that the guys in Benghazi, bad guys, right, absolutely bad guys, extremists, terrorists, saw what happened in Cairo and said, let's go do the same thing to the State Department facility. And they did the assault on the State Department facility and then they followed, they followed the State Department guys from the State Department facility to the CIA facility, conducted an attack immediately on the CIA facility and were repulsed by my security guys. And then they came back four hours later with much heavier weapons, including mortars, right? So one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, is people have pointed to these mortars, right, as this is evidence of pre-planning. Right? This is evidence and, and, and the effectiveness of the mortar fire. One of the questions you have to ask yourself is, if there was a lot of pre-planning, why didn't they bring those mortars to the first attack against the State Department facility or to the first attack against the CIA facility? Why did they wait until almost nine hours later? Because they 
the answer to that question is because they just went and got the mortars right, at the last minute for that third attack. And people say they brought five mortars, three of them were really effective. My question is, why'd they only bring five? Libya was a country awash in mortars. Why'd they only bring five? They had, they had time to fire a lot more than five. They only fired five. Answer, that's all they brought. That's all they had. That's all they could find in the short period of time that they planned this operation. Now, you, you know, the question here and the issue that you raised in the book is, did you work in conjunction with the administration? Absolutely not. Right? These, were, these were calls by the analysts. And one of the things that everybody needs to know about analysts at CIA is they take great pride in calling things like they see them. They take great pride in actually telling policymakers that you're wrong about something. They actually like to stick their finger in the policymaker's eyes and say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong about that. Um, so there was absolutely no political influence on the analysis here. I didn't tell the analysts what to think, as some folks have, have claimed. The analysts did their job. Um, Dr. Petraeus and I defended the analysts. We both believed what the analysts had to say. Um, Dr. Petraeus defended it the next day at a principals meeting. He believed the analysts. I believed the analysts. Um, and like I said, most of their judgments have held up, including the fact that there was little pre-planning. I've never seen any significant evidence that there's been pre-planning. All right, we're going to move on to the Iraq War. Uh, you wrote in your book, uh, we're talking about Secretary of State Colin Powell. Uh, on a number of occasions in recent years, Secretary Powell has expressed chagrin that no one from the intelligence community has publicly come forward and apologized to him for putting his well-deserved reputation for probity at risk by arming him with bad intelligence to use as the basis of the UN speech. But the CIA and the broader intelligence community clearly failed him and the American public. So as someone in the chain of command at the time of the Iraq WMD analysis was provided, I would like to use this opportunity to publicly apologize to Secretary Powell. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So there were two big, at the time of, in the months leading up to the Iraq war, there were two big intelligence judgments to be made. One is, what was the status of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction program? And the second was, what was the relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda? Um, on the first, what was the status of his weapons of mass destruction program? The analysts at CIA, in fact, the analysts in the entire US intelligence community, in fact, the analysts in every intelligence service on the planet that looked at the question came to the same conclusion. This guy has chemical weapons. This guy has a biologic weapons production capability. And this guy is reconstituting his nuclear weapons program. That's what the analysts believed. Um, they turned out to be wrong. All of these people who looked at this question turned out to be wrong. We can talk about why if you want to, but we turned out to be wrong. Um, the reason I apologize to Colin Powell is twofold. One is, I think Colin Powell is a remarkable American. I think he served his country with um, great distinction in job after job after job after job. Um, he deserves he deserves the stellar reputation that he had going into this UN speech. This UN speech, and he did not say anything at the UN that the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community did not believe. This UN speech tarnished his reputation. He's the first person to tell you that. And I've heard him say that, that the Iraq WMD presentation at the UN is gonna be on his tombstone. He's carried this with him. I've also heard him say that nobody from the CIA ever, ever apologized to me. I was the number three on the analytic side of the agency when we did this analysis that we got wrong. And so given all of that, I wanted to apologize to him. And I also, I also didn't want to surprise him. I didn't want him to pick up the book and right, see this in there. So I sent him the chapter ahead of time. And he called me and we talked for about 45 minutes and he was deeply appreciative of the apology. Would you agree that the war was sold to the American public largely on the basis of WMD, weapons of mass destruction? Yeah, I wouldn't say sold, right? Because that well, I, implies- I didn't mean it in a negative way. Yeah, I just yeah. meant that was, that was the- Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you know, President Bush would have, to, would have to tell you himself, but 
you know, here's, it's very important. One of the, the, the main job of an analyst is to put things in context. And so one of the things that I try to do in the book is put some of these big decisions in context. So what was the context in which President Bush made this decision, right? 9-11 um, had just happened. Largest single attack on America in our history. 3,000 people had just been killed. The CIA was telling him that Saddam Hussein, one of our primary enemies, a sworn enemy of the United States, had active weapons of mass destruction program, including a nuclear weapons program. And we were telling him that Saddam Hussein supports international terrorist groups, not Al-Qaeda, we can talk about that if you want, not Al-Qaeda, but Palestinian terrorist groups. And so there sits President Bush just having faced this huge attack on the United States, understanding that job number one of a president is to protect the American people, and we're telling him that this guy's got weapons of mass destruction and provides support to terrorist groups, right? And so he's, he's sitting there thinking, you know, if Saddam uses these weapons against us, or if Saddam gives these weapons to a terrorist group and they use these weapons against us, boy, that could make 9-11 look small. I think that's what drove President Bush to action in Iraq, and it's exactly what led a, a majority of Congress to support him for exactly the same reason. Well, so absolutely, absolutely, the analysis on, on Iraq having weapons of mass destruction played into his thinking, no doubt about it. Uh, I mean, look, these are tough calls, and, and nobody gets them all right. But did the CIA have an obligation to, to do more to find out more directly rather than based on circumstantial evidence? Yeah. So great question. Fa fabulous question, David. Um, when, you read about, when you read about the intelligence failure that was Iraq weapons of mass destruction, you will read, you will read mostly about the failed analysis. In fact, there's been books written about it. Academics have written articles. Um, this has been studied to death, and I've read it all. Believe me, I was involved in this, and I've read it all. Um, but part of the failure here was something that never gets talked about. Part of the failure here was not just the analysts at CIA, but the people at CIA who are responsible for collecting secrets. People at CIA who are responsible for recruiting other human beings to spy for the United States. They were not successful in getting a human agent close enough to Saddam's inner circle to find out what Saddam was really doing. And what he was really doing was, was believing that the only way that he could get out from under sanctions was to get rid of his weapons programs. He believed the CIA would see that. The CIA would tell the president about it. The president would get rid of sanctions. But he didn't want anybody else to know that he had gotten rid of these programs because they were a deterrent to his main enemy, Iran. So he wanted to keep it secret that he had gotten rid of the programs. Turns out, and by the way, he planned all along to eventually go back to his weapons programs after sanctions went away. How do we know this? Because he told us this. After he was captured, we had long, long discussions with him, and he told us exactly what he was thinking. So it turns out that he overestimated the capabilities of the Central Intelligence Agency, interestingly enough. But, but for example, the, 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 the part that, that deals with having access to nuclear or redeveloping nuclear weapons, it, my understanding is it was based on the fact that Iraq, Iraq, Iraq had acquired aluminum casings right. Right. That, that are often used in that process, but are also used for other things. Right. Right. So it sounds shaky to well, me. Well, no. I mean, uh, look, um, the aluminum tubes, and we can talk about aluminum tubes uh, if, if you want. I don't um, know that we need to go into a lot of detail. But, 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 but just, just let me say this. Um, that was one of the factors that led the analysts to the nuclear conclusion. There were a lot of others. Um, the Department of Energy, um, which concurred in the judgment that Saddam had re was reconstituting his nuclear weapons program, didn't buy the aluminum tubes argument, but thought the rest of the evidence was strong enough to make that judgment. Did the CIA ever do an analysis of, of what to expect if we go to war in Iraq and what the ultimate outcome could be? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we did it in, 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 
in, in, in different places. I think we owed President Bush, before he went to war, we owed him what's called a national intelligence estimate, which is the, the kind of elite analysis by the intelligence community. We owed him, here are the implications if you go to war. Here's what to expect in Iraqi society, Iraqi politics, if you go to war, right? Here's what's important. Here are the key factors that are going to determine whether this place stays stable or this place becomes unstable. I think we, 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 we did that in pieces. We didn't pull it together in one place form. Because when you look at what has happened, it's, it's not a pretty picture. I mean, Saddam Hussein is gone. But aside from that, Iran has now emerged as a huge world power because we talked about Iraq was the main country holding yeah. them back. Um, you know, the, yeah. ISIS and Al-Qaeda yeah. had a field day. It was a, in your book you talk about that. Yeah. Now they're taking huge portions of territory yeah. back. So, so I think that, you know, in the book, what I actually say in the book is that, and I, I, I really believe it, the decision to invade Iraq at the end of the day, I don't think was the decision that brought about the instability in Iraq. The decisions that brought about the instability in Iraq were the debathification decisions by the coalition provisional authority, right? Those after the military operations ended um, and you know we were in charge of Iraq, Ian Bremmer was in charge of Iraq, um, there were two decisions, the first two decisions of that coalition provisional authority were one, to remove from the government anybody who was a member of the Ba'ath Party, and to um, basically disband any organization that had a very, very close relationship with the Ba'ath Party. Those two decisions resulted in the collapse of the Iraqi military, the Iraqi Security Service, and the Iraqi Intelligence Service, because all those guys were members of the Ba'ath Party. Right? And all of a sudden, they didn't have jobs anymore. So what'd they do? A whole bunch of them went to work for the insurgency, and a whole bunch of them went to work for Al-Qaeda in Iraq because they were mad, number one, and number two, they got actually paid by those organizations. Um, so it was those two decisions that I think were the critical decisions that led to the instability. Um, when, when, you, when you look back as the former deputy director of the CIA, speaking for yourself, not on behalf of the agency, was it were you satisfied with how things worked out in Iraq? Of course not. I mean, it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, but one of the things you have to think about is, okay, what would the place look like? What would the place look like today if we hadn't done this? You know, you got to you got to do the counterfactual, right? So, what would Iraq look like today if we had not invaded Iraq? So let me just give you a possibility. You know, I, who knows? But let me just give you a possibility. So sanctions would have eventually gone away, without a doubt. There was no way that the United States was going to hold these sanctions together over the long term. They would have gone away. He would have, he would have restarted his weapons programs, and he would, have, he would have had chemical weapons again. He would have had a biological weapons capability, and he probably would have developed a nuclear weapon. So either you would have had to have dealt with that if you saw it happening, or he would have one. And then you fast forward and you say, okay, what happened in, in Tunisia, what happened in Egypt, what happened in Libya, what happened in Syria could have, in terms of the Arab Spring, could have easily happened in Iraq. In other words, Saddam's people rise up and say, we want you to go away, right? Mm -hmm. And so you might have a country that has these weapons of mass destruction that has the same instability today that Libya has. So there's no, there's no you, you can't look back and say that, that if we hadn't done this, that Iraq wouldn't look like this today. Mm -hmm. It could easily look like this today with nuclear weapons. One of the things that you talk about that, that sort of connects Benghazi and, and the Iraq war was the politicalization of, of intelligence by the administrations in power at the time, one Democrat, one Republican. In fact, uh, w with regard to the lead up to the, to the Iraq war, you wrote about Scooter Libby, who worked for Vice President Cheney. Libby's attempt to intimidate a CIA official was the most blatant attempt to politicize intelligence that I saw in 33 years in the business, and it would not be the last yeah. attempt. What, what impact 
is the, this politicizing of intelligence having. And, and, and does it distort what the CIA is doing? And, and does the CIA, is the CIA able to stand up so, to the president and say, no, yeah, this, so let is, me, this is what it is? Yes, yeah, so let me talk about it. This is really important. So remember I said there were two big judgments on Iraq prior to the war, weapons of mass destruction and then Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Right, on Iraq and Al-Qaeda, what we said was, what the analysts believed was there were some historic conversations between Iraqi intelligence and Al-Qaeda, but that as of 2002, there was no current relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. There was no Iraqi involvement in 9-11. There was not even Iraqi foreknowledge of 9-11. They were as surprised as we were. That's what we said, right? Scooter Libby did not like what we said. He believed there was a connection. He thought we were wrong. Right? And he, after we put this paper out that said what I just said, he called up my boss and told her to withdraw the paper and fix it because it was wrong. Well, we just put our hands up and said, no, we're not doing that. I told you earlier, we, we are nonpartisan. We call it like we see it. Right? We're, we're the umpire. We're the referee. We call it like we see it. We didn't budge. We didn't budge. Um, Scooter Libby called John McLaughlin, who was then the deputy director of CIA, to complain about the paper. And George Tenet and John McLaughlin said, no, stop. Um, and then President Bush did something really, really important. So my boss, who Scooter Libby called and said, withdraw this paper, and she refused, um, she briefed President Bush on Christmas Eve um, in 2002 went to Camp David to give him his daily intelligence briefing. And at the end of that briefing, as she was getting up to go, President Bush said, Jamie, just one more thing. I've heard about this, this issue regarding Iraq and Al-Qaeda. I've heard about the pressure on you guys. I just want you to know that I have your back, and I want you to continue to call it like you see it. Very, very, very important thing for the President of the United States to say. But in my experience of 33 years, I have never seen an analyst buckle under to anybody trying to get them to say anything that they don't believe. We, we train analysts that way. We beat it into them. They're proud of it. Um, they really call it like they see it. And they, so, don't, they, don't budge to, they don't budge to pressure. In fact, the pressure s strengthens their back even more. Let's talk about Osama bin Laden. Sure. Uh, some of his uh, material was just released a few days ago. Uh, some of his uh, notes and some of the books that, he, that he's been reading and so on and so forth. Um, he says that um, Al Qaeda saw opportunities in the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. which is something that it seems uh, the West didn't necessarily recognize. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, so, um, so with regard to the Arab Spring, there was a couple things that we got right and there was a couple things we got wrong. Um, and, and, and by the way, one of the points I want to make here is that um, you know, the work that the agencies asked to do is really hard. The analysts only get hard problems. They don't get the easy stuff. They only get the hard questions. And they get most things right, and occasionally they get some things wrong. It's really hard, right? So Arab Spring. Um, First of all, we provided what we call strategic warning. What does that mean? For years, we had been telling presidents, national security teams, Congresses, multiple Congresses, that there were pressures building in the Arab world that were unsustainable. That there were political pressures, economic pressures, demographic pressures, societal pressures that were building for change. And we wrote that over a period of years in depth. We provided strategic warning on the Arab Spring. What we didn't do, one of the things we didn't get quite right is we didn't call, we didn't provide what we call tactical warning. Tactical warning is we think this place is going to blow up over the next six months. We think that we've reached the tipping point. Right? That's very difficult to see coming. We didn't see it. We didn't write it. Okay? Shame on us. We could have done a better job mining social media to see what the Arab street was thinking and saying to each other about what was happening in those countries. Could have done a better job at that. Once the Arab Spring happened, we got something really important right, 
and we got something important wrong. The thing we got right was as soon as Tunisia happened, we said this has the potential to be a contagion. This has the potential to spread. And that was the first real uprising, wasn't Tunisia it? was the first. Yeah. Tunisia was the first, and we said it was going to spread before Egypt even began to show that it was shaky. So we got that right. We nailed that, right? And, but the thing we didn't get quite right was the analysts said as soon as the Arab Spring started that the Arab Spring was going to undermine al-Qaeda. And their, their argument was that it was going to undermine al-Qaeda because it was going to undercut their narrative that violence was necessary for political change. And they may have been right about that, but what they missed were two other really powerful dynamics that turned out to make the Arab Spring a really an Al-Qaeda Spring, which is the title in the chapter, which is the title in the book about this particular these two particular dynamics. And the two particular dynamics are, number one, the Arab Spring undercut the willingness of some Arab countries to fight extremism inside their border. Best example is Egypt under President Morsi, where the guys who had fought terrorists for years in Egypt still had their same capabilities, but didn't think they had the political top cover anymore to fight terrorists. And so they stopped. And Al-Qaeda came back to Egypt for the first time in 25 years. Within a matter of weeks, was back in Egypt, back in business. And then the other dynamic was, was you had countries who had a willingness to fight extremists inside their border, but no longer had the capability. Because their institutions that, that were, were, were there to fight Al-Qaeda and fight extremists were significantly weakened by the Arab Spring. Best example, Libya, where the governments, the post qaddafi governments wanted to fight terrorism, but the military was gone, the intelligence service was gone, the security service was gone. So those two dynamics significantly overpowered the dynamic that the analysts saw. Is some of it wishful thinking? I mean, is some of it that we see other parts of the world in our own image, but no, in fact if, they're not? If CIA analysts have any bias, it's towards seeing the glass half empty rather than half full. Mm -hmm. Their bias is to see the downside, not the upside. Look, I wish I could lighten things up, but uh, <laughs> this is serious stuff, so. Let's talk about waterboarding. Uh, you talk about it at great length in the book, uh, and you talk about all of the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, which, which some people, critics, call torture. Um, and uh, the one that you point out that you really had serious doubts about and reservations was waterboarding. Uh, almost, I got the feeling you had mixed feelings about it. Yeah, so this is a really important issue, right? This is a really important issue. Um, the, first thing, the first thing you need to know is that this was not just CIA's program. This was America's program. What do I mean by that? The CIA conceived it. The CIA carried it out. But it did so at the direction of the President of the United States. It did so with the approval of the rest of the national security team. It did so with the approval of the Department of Justice, who said it was legal. We'll come back to that. And it did so with the approval of the leadership of both intelligence committees in Congress, Democrat and Republican. This was America's program. So it's very important to remember that. This was not some rogue CIA operation. Second thing, I talked about context in the Iraq case. What's the context here? The context is, again, 9-11, 3,000 people just been killed. CIA had credible information that there was a second wave attack plan. So there was a second wave of attacks coming at us that were the equivalent size of 9-11. Credible information. The CIA had information at the time that it didn't know if it was credible or not, but it turned out to be true that Osama bin Laden was meeting with Pakistani nuclear scientists to try to get his hands on a nuclear weapon. The CIA had information at the time that it didn't know if it was credible or not. It turned out not to be that Al-Qaeda was trying to smuggle a nuclear weapon into New York City. So the level of the threat in the Oval Office every morning was atop of the ceiling. George Tennant and I used to walk into the Oval Office and say to ourselves as we were walking in, is today the day we're gonna get hit again? That's what it felt like. It felt like the ticking time bomb scenario, right? 
The other part of the context is that because the Pakistanis agreed to work with us against Al-Qaeda, the Pakistanis started arresting senior Al-Qaeda operatives who we believed had information related to these plots that we were telling the president about every morning. The other part of the context is that these senior Al-Qaeda guys had counter-interrogation training and were not responding to traditional interrogation techniques. And the counterterrorism guys at CIA came to Director Tennant and said, these guys know about these plots. Traditional interrogation techniques aren't working. We think we have to try these enhanced techniques. Or, they said, we think Americans are going to die. George Tennant had the same conversation with the White House, and the enhanced interrogation program was born. That's the context. Put yourself in the shoes of George Tennant. Put yourself in, in the shoes of the president, right? Really tough decision to make. Now, let's take a look at it from a kind of a break it down analytically. There's four questions, I think, that matter here. One is, was it legal? Right? And I know there's debates about that now, but at the time, the Department of Justice said on multiple occasions, this is not torture. This does not violate U.S. torture statutes or U.S. treaty obligations with regard to torture. This is legal. This is not torture. They said that on multiple occasions. That's why I react so strongly when somebody calls it torture, because the Department of Justice said it wasn't. Number two, was it effective? And I'll be very honest with you here, there's a strong disagreement here between the Democrats on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which produced a report a couple years ago, just released publicly less than a year ago, that says that the CIA did not get a single piece of useful information from enhanced interrogation techniques. Dianne Feinstein. Dianne Feinstein. The CIA says just the opposite. The CIA says that enhanced interrogation techniques produced a boatload of intelligence that stopped, attacked, uh, stopped attacks, saved lives, and took additional senior Al-Qaeda guys off the battlefield, right? That's a big difference. Where's Michael Morell on this, right? I didn't know about the enhanced interrogation program until 2006, right? By 2006, Mike Hayden, the director at the time, was trying to wind this thing down. Right, trying to find a way to end this program. We're not going to be in this business for the long term. Um, and so I didn't pay a lot of attention to the effectiveness argument because we were essentially out of the business by 2006. But I did pay attention to it in my last months on the job. As acting director and deputy director, I was overseeing the agency's response to the Diane Feinstein report. And so I really studied the issue. And I can tell you that I convinced myself I went into it with an open mind. You know, I wasn't part of this thing early on. I wasn't trying to protect anybody. I went into it with an open mind and I looked at it closely and I convinced myself that, yeah, they were effective, absolutely effective. Um, then, th let me tell you why I came to that conclusion. Because I looked at information that these detainees provided before enhanced interrogation techniques. It was not full answers to questions. It was not specific information, and it was not actionable. You couldn't do anything with it. After enhanced interrogation techniques, full answers to questions, specific information, actionable information. No doubt in my mind they were effective. No doubt in my mind that the Senate report is wrong in that regard. Third question, was it necessary to do these things? They can be effective, but not necessary. Right? Was there another way to get this information? And the honest answer to that is we'll never know. We'll never know. And that's true with almost every decision that anybody makes, right? So was it necessary to drop two atomic bombs on Japan to bring about the timely surrender of the Japanese at the end of World War II? We'll never know. Was it necessary for Abraham Lincoln to suspend habeas corpus to win the Civil War? We'll never know. So the necessity question is not one that I find particularly interesting. Then the last question I think is the most important. Even if it's legal, and even if it's, even if it's effective, is it the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to do morally to, to inflict these harsh techniques on another human being? Well, the first thing you have to look at is each technique separately. You can't bunch them together. One of the techniques was simply grabbing somebody by the lapels 
if they weren't paying attention to you during an interrogation? I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I bet you the vast majority of you would say, hey, that's okay. Right? So you've got to look at each one of these individually. Right? And they go all the way from kind of that to waterboarding. Right? So you, you go from the kind of benign to the extremely harsh right, when you ask this question about morality and right or wrong. But a lot of people try, and, and by the way, the Senate report never ever dealt with this most difficult of questions, the morality question, the right and wrong question. Never ever talk about it. Um, some people think it's easy, right? Some people look at one side of this morality coin and say, and say, how could the United States of America, which stands for human freedom and human dignity in the world, do these things to another human being? And so some people make it sound easy, but the other side to the morality coin is how could you not do these things if you believe that you need to do it in order to save American lives? These are decisions for presidents, right? and the president made this decision. Now, with regard to what my own views on waterboarding, um, if I were captured by the enemy, and I were grabbed by the lapels, would I come back and say it was tortured? No. If I were captured by the enemy and I were waterboarded, would I come back and say it were tortured? Yeah, you bet I would, right? So I, I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable with waterboarding. But here's my moral dilemma, and I write about this in the book. Here's my moral dilemma. When I was looking at the program in depth and looking at the question of effectiveness, you know what technique was by far the most effective? Waterboarding. Yeah. So the one that I'm most uncomfortable with was the most effective. So this is not easy. This is not easy at all. And my final point here is that I do think this is something the American people need to know about. The media needs to talk about. Academics need to talk about. Historians need to talk about it. Because it was one of the country's responses to 9-11. But I want all the facts out there. I want the real history of this program out there and what the, Senate, what the Senate produced, what the Senate Intelligence Committee produced, the Senate Democrats produced, um, isn't anywhere near close to the real history. I want the real history out there and then let's talk about it. All right, we're, we're gonna take questions now from you uh, and we have uh, folks that have microphones roaming around. So maybe raise your hand or do Thank we you, want Dave. We got a question here, right here in the front row, second front row. Thank you, it was very, very interesting. Uh, if you were um, talking with a, an analyst, a uh, domestic analyst, um, just, who's just starting out, um, what one piece of advice would you give them, and maybe what two book recommendations, um, necessary books to read, what, what would those be? Yeah, great question. So, um, the one piece of advice that I would give them is this really weird thing that I have done every day of my life ever since I started work, which is when I went home at night, at the end of the day, I would ask myself, how did you do today and how could you have done better? And in that conversation with myself, I was harder on myself than any boss ever was. Um, and then I took, the, right, I took the actions that were kind of dictated by that pretty harsh self-assessment. And I think that is the reason why I progressed as fast as I did because I learned a lot from what I did every day. I still do it. I'll go back to the hotel tonight and I will think about how did you do with the folks at the Nixon Library and how could you have done better? And it's just, it's just kind of how I'm wired and that would be my one piece of advice to, to anybody in any job, including being an analyst at the CIA. Um, in terms of books to read, that's a really tough one. Um, you know, I would, I would tell them to read The Great War of Our Time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on. That um, was a gimme. Look, I, 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 I would tell them just to read as much as you possibly can, right? And, 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 and 
and particularly about the part of the world that, that you're responsible for, just read everything that's ever been written. Um, is one of the things, one of the, the, the characteristics of a successful analyst is, is somebody who has what I call intellectual curiosity. Right? They're not satisfied with the surface, understanding the surface of a problem. They really want to get deep. So you actually want somebody who wants to read all that stuff. Right? If you're the Vladimir Putin analyst, you want to read everything that's ever been written about Vladimir Putin. Thank you. We have a question right here in the back row. Hi, my, my question is, uh, what's your thoughts on the value of predictive analytics, uh, such as the products provided by Palantir and Recorded Future? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, a lot of people think, a lot of people think that, C, that, that the main job of CIA analysts is to predict the future. Uh, and it's not. Um, it's not at all. Um, there are really two jobs, right? One job is to say what's happening today. So what's the status of the Iranian nuclear program today? What's the capabilities of al-Qaeda in Yemen today? What are they planning today? Right? So a lot of work is what's going on today and how do you think about it, right? Um, that's the bulk of the work that analysts do. When they do think about the future, they don't predict the future. What they try to do is tell you the key factors that will determine what the future looks like. And that's, that's a lot more important to a policymaker than getting a prediction of the future. Um, because knowing the factors that will determine the future give policymakers ideas about how to influence what the future might look like. And simply saying, here's what the future is going to look like is not that helpful. Um, and so if somebody, can, if somebody can actually tell me what the future is going to look like, yeah, I want to talk to them. But I've never found anybody who can. Um, and so this approach to just talking about the factors that will determine the future is much more powerful in my mind. We have a question to your right. Hi. Thank Hi. you for coming and sharing with us today. My question is, isn't it a possibility when Benghazi was going on, and the first, thing, the first thing that happened was kind of a roux, and maybe because we didn't do anything about it, they said, hey, America doesn't care, and maybe they were prepared to come in and do what they did. So I don't think it was a roux, right? It wasn't, it, you know, they didn't like, we're going to go test this, and then we'll see how they respond, and, and then, you know, do more if they don't respond, right? I, I don't think they, that's not the way they think, right? They, they, they attacked the place, and when there wasn't a response, absolutely they would continue, right? But it's not like they tested it. Um, certainly, if there, was, if there had been a response, if there was a response that was available, they wouldn't have ever had the second and third attack. So that's absolutely right. But I don't think that's the way they thought about it. By the way, there was a video of, of the, the attack, yes. though, right? Yes. But Which it was I, never released. It's never been released. And, um, I'll tell you that the head of the intelligence community, Jim Clapper, um, who is a great American, um, was in favor of releasing the video. I was in favor of releasing the video because I think if you see the video, you say, oh, that's not a military assault. That's more like a mob. And I wanted that video out there so that all the American people could see it. But well, who didn't want it out there? Um, I think there was you know, a, a view that um, you don't want to release that kind of stuff. You don't want to set the precedent for releasing it all the time. I can't tell you why. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that Jim and I were in favor of it and we, didn't win, we did not win the day. From a gentleman to your left. Hey, Director, uh, my question is uh, a little bit outside the Middle East. What's your assessment, assessment of uh, Russia and the Baltic states in, in that region? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, context is everything. So let me give you, th you know, the three pieces of context I think that are really important here to understand what Russia is doing and what, what Russia Ukraine is all about. So the first piece of context is that, you know, what is, what is Putin trying to do? And if he were here right now and you were all of his oligarch buddies and you asked him, what are you doing? What are you doing in Ukraine, right? What he would tell you and he would use these words, this is not some analytic construct from CIA, he would tell you, I want to reestablish the Russian Empire. I want to reestablish the Russian Empire. And you'd say, what does that mean? And he'd say, 
I want to I want to control or I want significant influence in every part of the world that used to be part of the Russian Empire which just happens to be match up pretty closely to the former Soviet Union by the way um, and this is his this is what he wants his legacy to be and this is long term for him and by the way he thinks he's going to be running that country for the next 20 to 25 years he's not going anywhere in his mind so that's the first piece of context. The second piece of context is that every part of that former Soviet Union, every part of that former Russian Empire is important to him, but Ukraine is particularly important. Ukraine is particularly important for a couple of reasons. One is history. When the original Russian state was founded in like the 9th or 10th BC, I never studied, um, Ukraine was part of Russia. And the capital wasn't in Moscow, it was in Kiev. So if you're in Russia, you think of Ukraine as part of Russia. So one part of this is history. The other part of this is, is ethnicity. Russians are Slavs. Ukrainians are Slavs. They think of themselves as brothers. Third is Vladimir Putin does have a great fear. Vladimir Putin's fear is that the people of Russia are going to wake up someday and they're going to have their own Arab Spring. They're going to come out into the streets of Moscow and they're going to say, we don't like the direction you're taking our country. Um, we don't like you anymore. We want you to go away and we want a greater say in how we're governed. He is scared to death of that. Where did that happen? It happened in the streets of Kiev. It happened in a Slavic country. He does not want to become what happened. He does not want to have what happened in Kiev become a precedent for Moscow. So Ukraine is really important to him. That's the second piece of context. And then the third piece of context is, who is this guy? And right? how does he think? Right? And I think that Bob Gates put it best. When you look in his eyes, you see KGB, KGB, KGB. Hmm. Right? He is a thug. I hope he's listening right now. He is, a, he is a thug. He is a bully. He only understands relative power, strength and weakness. He does not believe something that... that Every Western businessman believes that it's possible to sit down in a negotiation and have a win-win outcome. He only believes in win-lose. And he's got an entrepreneurial, risk-taking personality, which is he's a risk-taker, um, but he's a particular kind of risk-taker that makes him very, very dangerous. When he takes a risk and believes he succeeds, as he's done in, in the Ukraine, he's often willing to take an even bigger risk. And that's where I worry about the Baltics because he was willing to go to war in the Ukraine. We were not. But in the Baltics, I actually think NATO is willing to go to war over the Baltics, and I hope he understands that. From a gentleman in the second row. You mentioned weapons of mass destruction and how the intelligence communities across the world predicted that Hussein had them. Well, I do know that he had a very active program in biological warfare, which was housed in trucks and not big facilities like for nuclear production. And I do remember reports stating that as we were preparing and getting troops on the border of Iraq, great transports of large vans were headed to Syria, right. which I think probably related to his program of uh, biological warfare. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I so wish that you were right about this program being shipped off to Syria, <laughs> because then we wouldn't have been wrong. <laughs> but unfortunately, um, there was never any, any evidence, real evidence, of him shipping anything to Syria. Um, when the U.S. went in and, you know, it didn't find anything, and, you know, we were wrong. I wish, I, I so wish you were right about Syria. We have time for one more question right in the front row. I'd like you to address information about ISIL. I'd like to know, you said the Ba'ath soldiers made up part of ISIL. Is it, where else are they and coming from? And why do the Iraqis drop all their equipment and run when they know they're going to be slaughtered by them? Yeah, so it's a great question. Where did ISIS come from, right? I call them ISIS. Some people call them ISIL. Some people call them Daesh. they got all sorts of names. Um, where'd they come from? So they came from what was called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, they simply changed their name. I'll come to that in a second. 
Um, but Al-Qaeda in Iraq became a group after the U.S. invaded Iraq, and they became one of the opposing forces to the, to the quote, U.S. occupation, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And, you know, they got, their, they got their men largely from the Sunni population, um, including some people who used to work for the, who used to work for the Iraqi government. Um, and they ended up fighting the U.S. for a long period of time, um, and we ended up killing many of them on the battlefield, of the battlefields of Iraq. They ended up killing many American soldiers themselves. Um, but by the time the United States left, militarily left Iraq at the end of 2011, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was at its weakest point. It was at its nadir. Um, but almost immediately after the United States military left, Al-Qaeda in Iraq started to rebound. And it started to rebound for two reasons. Number one, the military pressure was taken off because the U.S. military and U.S. intelligence were very effective in helping the Iraqis take on Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So that pressure was removed and they immediately started to rebound. The other thing that happened was when the U.S. left, former Prime Minister Maliki was emboldened to undertake a series of steps that that, that basically disenfranchised the Sunnis, right? And so you had these moderate Sunnis who were so frustrated with Prime Minister Maliki, a Shia, that moderate Sunnis started supporting and even joining Al-Qaeda in Iraq, so they also, they also rebounded because of that. Then the Syrian civil war breaks out. Syrian civil war breaks out, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq wants to be part of the action in Syria. So they go across the border, and that's when they change their name. Because you can't be fighting in Syria and be called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So they simply rebranded themselves as ISIS. And three things happened in Syria that made them really, really strong. The first was they got their hands on a whole bunch of new recruits, both Syrian Sunnis who joined them, as well as all these foreign fighters who were flowing into Syria to fight in the civil war, joined joined ISIS, so a lot more men. They also got their hands on a lot of money. Um, the way you get money in the terrorism business is to be successful. That's how you get donations, that's how you get financing, is by being successful, conducting an attack, taking territory, so they got themselves a lot of money. And they also got themselves a lot of weapons, because they were overrunning um, a Syrian government weapon stockpiles, and so they got themselves some very sophisticated weapons. So, they went from their weakest point at the end of 2011 to an incredibly strong position um, by, by late 2013, early 2014. Um, they take a lot of territory in Syria, um, and they go back into Iraq, and they do this blitzkrieg across Iraq, um, which would not have been possible without what you said happened, which is the Iraqi military just melted away. And the Iraqi military melted away largely because of Prime Minister Maliki's mismanagement of the military. He put, he put incompetent Shia officers in charge of the military, and in a very short period of time, they destroyed what the United States had created and trained in terms of the Iraqi military. So that's what happened. That's where we are. Um, ISIS is... ISIS is a very significant threat to the stability of the Middle East. That's why we're doing what we're doing. They're a, they're, a, they're, a, they're a moderate terrorist threat to us today. Al-Qaeda actually in Yemen and in, in another Al-Qaeda group in Syria and Al-Qaeda in Pakistan still are a greater threat to us than ISIS. But given enough time in Iraq and Syria, ISIS will pose the kind of threat that Al-Qaeda posed to us before 9-11. Thank you, Director Morrell. Please give both gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.